Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donna Martinez. Welcome once again to Shaftesbury Society. We've got a really, really special one for you today. So glad that you are along. So as our country faces four years of expensive and misguided government first policies emanating from Washington, D.C., dominated by progressives now, and by the way, a lot of the same types of things happening in Raleigh, North Carolina, from our progressive governor and his administration as well. Those of us who are defenders of freedom and free markets are faced with our biggest challenge in many, many years. Where does conservatism go from here? We at the John Locke Foundation are very pleased to be joining today with National Review Institute to talk about the road ahead, the principles that have made our nation and our state great, the opportunities for states like North Carolina to lead the way back to freedom. So we have a spe several special guests with us. Ramesh uh, Ponuru is with the National Review Institute and National Review. Amy Cook, you all are familiar with. She is the CEO of the John Locke Foundation, also the publisher of Carolina Journal. But to begin, I'd like to introduce to you Chris Ciancimino. Chris is Director of Regional Development for National Review Institute. Chris, so uh, welcome. So glad to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thanks for the great pronunciation of my challenging last name. You had it just perfect. Like you said, uh, my name is Christian Samino. I'm Director of Regional Development for National Review Institute. For those of you on today's call who may not be familiar with the Institute, we are the nonprofit parent organization of National Review Magazine. As a journalistic think tank, NRI advances the principles championed by our, by our founder, William F. Buckley Jr and complements the mission of the magazine, including by supporting and promoting NR's top, top, top talent, talent like Ramesh Panuru. Like everyone, we've had a, a challenging year and had to make some changes in our programming in 2020, uh, but we did successfully adapt to virtual programming, which allowed, us to, which allowed us to reach a wider audience than ever before. We expanded our popular Burke to Buckley program a seminar that teaches the foundations of conservative thought to mid-career professionals to include a virtual course open to anyone intellectually curious about the principles behind our movement. We started hosting book and movie club events every month to provide a way for our donors to engage with each other on interesting topics from anywhere in the world. In fact, our spring movie club calls begin tonight when NRI fellow Jay Nordlinger will begin a conversation on the works of George Orwell, the first of three calls on the subject. In October, our annual William F. Buckley Jr. Prize Dinner became a gala at home, and our largest ever crowd celebrated James L. Buckley and Virginia James for their contributions to the conservative movement. This coming May 20th and 21st, remote guests will be invited to tune in to a live stream of our Biennial Ideas Summit featuring panel discussions with notable conservatives and top NR writers discussing the important issues of the day. And finally, less than a year since its launch, our new National Review Capital Matters Initiative, a bold new effort to explain, defend, and celebrate capitalism, has proven an indispensable resource for those seeking financial coverage from a free market perspective with what we recall a National Review sensibility. Capital Matters' new podcast called The Capital Record, sponsored by National Review Institute and hosted by trustee David Bonson, provides a new way to promote our unabashedly free market ideas to a large audience. You can learn more about all of these events and programming by visiting nrinstitute.org. So thank you so much for the time. Again, uh, back to today's event. One of the ways, like I said, we do connect our writers um, to readers across the country is the regional partnerships event like this one. They serve two valuable purposes, one to amplify the work of NR writers beyond the pages of the magazine and to strengthen the conservative movement by supporting great allied state-based organizations like John Locke Foundation. Uh, so to tell you a little bit more about that, I'm gonna turn it back over to you um, to introduce both John Locke and our panelists for the day. Thank you so much. 
Chris, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. We are very pleased to be partnering with the National Review Institute today. And in just a moment, we're going to hear from one of those um, key fellows and writers that Chris was referring to, Ramesh Panuru. Um, Amy Cook, who is the uh, CEO of the John Locke Foundation, and she's also publisher of Carolina Journal. Amy, I have to say it was interesting listening to Chris because he talked about several things. Uh, first of all, intellectual curiosity, which is a key component of what we do here defending and advancing freedom here at the John Locke Foundation. And they also mentioned they're going to be talking about Orwell, and that's sort of where we are, unfortunately. <laughs> right. Actually, it's a great, great point about that, Donna. And one of the things during the, the shutdown, I actually um, great enrolled in great courses, and, um, and I watched an entire lecture series on George Orwell. It was absolutely fascinating. So I actually wrote that down on my notes. So um, one of the things, and first of all, thanks to National Review Institute and Donna, of course, you do a great job every single Monday with Shaftesbury. So I hope everybody tunes in every Monday at noon. But I, this one in particular, um, they all resonate with me, but this one really kind of hits close to home. This, what is the future of conservatism? And I really, when I think about the future of conservatism, I actually think about the future of freedom, which is really what it is from my perspective. The future of free markets, the, the, the future of free speech, the future of the right to assemble, to petition your government, the right to, to be free people. And so when I think about that, I, I'm gonna throw another question into this. And I think, um, it, it, it's this, and it's something I learned from my time in Colorado. What are we, meaning this sort of pro-freedom network, meaning organizations, various entities, and individuals, what are we willing to do to, de to defeat the progressive left? Um, and as I said, I really asked this as someone who has spent three decades, spent the last three decades prior to to being liberated and coming to the free state of North Carolina, where we are, we're still, we're still battling, we're still in the fight. But in Colorado, where um, I watched the left build a machine, an infrastructure that uh, that if you're on the left, there, you know, the the party, the candidates, special interest groups, you are loyal to the machine, um, and and the reason they did that is because they agreed that if they had a Democrat majority, that all of their policies could be put into place, or at least a better shot of being in place with a Democrat majority. So you checked your ego at the door, you checked your, uh, your, your pet policy or your pet project at the door. They had not just, they weren't just striving to win, they had one goal and it was to win, that was it. And you saw what happened, it began in 2004 with a couple of hiccups in there. Um, what happened in 2018 was the, the progressive left took control of every single lever of power at the state level in Colorado. Hadn't happened since like the 1930s. So um, for instance, I'll just like HR1, which is you know one of the things we'll probably touch on, the election part of that is based largely on the Colorado model that was passed in 2013 when it comes to conducting elections. So, so what we what we're seeing is this um, is this federalization of this infrastructure that Colorado initiated in 2004. And with that, I want I, I want to show a clip in just a second. And there are two people that that are going to be in this clip. And one of them is a man named Ted Trimpa. And if you've read the book, The Blueprint. You've heard of Ted Trimpa. He was the architect of the infrastructure, this machine, so to speak, that, um, that really flipped the state of Colorado. He's an absolutely brilliant strategist. I know him personally, very nice guy, but he is a take no prisoners when it comes to winning. 
And that's why I asked this question, what are we willing to do to defeat the forces uh, that, that don't want freedom? What are we willing to do as conservatives, as, as this freedom network, what are we willing to do um, in, order to, in order to defeat them? And, and I, wanna, I wanna play this clip because I think we need to know where each side is at least from the perspective of the left and the people you'll see, Ted Trimpa and my former boss, John Caldera, he actually hosts the show. And these are Ted Trimpa's words. These aren't my words. These are Ted Trimpa's words on the difference between what the left does and what the right does. And Mitch, can you please play that clip? I would argue your team is more about wanting to prove they're right rather than wanting to win. If the, if the objective is winning, winning, it changes so many different metrics. I mean, that sounds really simple, but you know, you really think about it. It, it can't be about, oh, well, if we get this, we're gonna get these three policies. If we get this, then this is what we can do. It, there's, everybody, there's also, has to, everybody has to check that at the door. Thank you, Mitch, for, for that. Amy, that is really fascinating. Help us understand a little bit more, if you would, Amy, about the difference between uh, winning and being right and uh, what those of us in the freedom movement need to check at the door if we're going to win this country back. So I want to I want to give a prime example of this um, and how they sort of what I would call federalized or nationalized that model. Because we know that they've been going state to state. We know in North Carolina that left had poured a ton of money into the state and still are trying to, to build out that exact same infrastructure. But they saw an opportunity in 2020, right? Um, and I'll back, Obama built his own machine and he didn't really give it to Hillary Clinton. So she kind of had to replicate it and build her own. And didn't, and she got beat by Trump, who had built his own kind of machine, which, by the way, Trump's machine got beat by what Ted Trippa does so well on the left, which is you check your stuff at the door and we plug in a candidate. So they plugged in Joe Biden, who clearly has cognitive issues. I mean, this is a guy who campaigned like um I mean, I don't think we've seen a campaign like what James Garfield, I think, was the last one who absolutely didn't campaign at all um, and, and still and won. Joe Biden didn't have to campaign. You can plug in anyone because you're loyal to this machine. Um, and I think what we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to come together as conservatives or this pro-freedom network, stop throwing stuff at one another? And are we willing to come together? Or can we check our egos and win? We, and, and from my perspective, freedom depends on it. Like if, if I got asked this question, we've been asked this question. If, if we believe all the things we say about the left, um, would we be fighting so hard amongst ourselves as opposed to forcing it the other direction? So that's just something to think about as we as we talk about this going forward during this next hour. I think that's pretty fascinating. Ramesh, what's your um, your reaction to that that clip and Amy's premise here? And by the way, welcome. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm sure that we can't be having this conversation in person, and, uh, and I hope that someday, uh, pretty soon, we will be able to do that. Um, you know, when uh, uh, Amy was talking, it reminded me of reading a, uh, a left-wing journalist writing uh, about the Carter years and uh, divisions in the Democratic Party during that time. And he interviewed a, this journalist interviewed uh, the head of a union, um, who was, uh, who was furious with what he perceived as the compromises and betrayals of the Carter administration. And then the journalist finally asked, so is there anything that Carter can do that would make you happy? And the, uh, and this, the union leader immediately spat back, no. 
And then he waited then after a moment, he said, wait, yes, die. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, so um, factional disputes inside a movement or a party can sometimes be more passionate, uh, more furious than the divisions between movements and parties. And I think that we've seen that psychological tendency uh, again and again. Uh, and it can be easy to get so caught up in some of these internecine disputes that you forget the reasons why um, you're involved in politics in the first place. Uh, and, and so I, I do think that conservatives, um, different strands of conservatives have tended to maybe overestimate some of the importance of some of our theoretical disputes among one another. Um, it is not the case that if sort of one faction of the right were to prevail that everything else would follow uh, along like, uh, like, like dominoes. Um, the conservative movement, the Republican party, it's a coalition. And the principal components of that coalition are each very large. But even when you put them all together, they're not a majority of the country. Uh, and so they've got to actually recruit people to be allies, um, to join them, or at least to be tactical allies for the span of an election or the span of a couple of years, um, if they're going to achieve something. And I do think that that's something that we sometimes lose sight of. I think that social media and the fragmentation of the media in general has helped to encourage this kind of splintering, um, because it makes us think that our little world is bigger than it actually is. You know, as I was uh, thinking about all of this and as, you know, a member of this freedom movement, I think about it every day. You know, how, how do I help people to understand that this country, at least in my view, is going in the wrong direction? And I, I wonder, at, as we look at building, building forward and trying to regain um, a really su a majority support for freedom and liberty, does it boil down to something as as maybe simplistic as we believe in equal opportunity, not equality of outcome. And there, that is a huge difference. Is that really where we are? Can we at least start there? Wow, John, I, uh, go ahead, Ramesh. No, go ahead. So, no, I think that's important. I think that is, that is a nice way of boiling down um, some of the differences. Um, but I also think that we have to do a better job as conservatives or libertarians or populists or what have you of explaining how our ideas uh, not don't just sort of make sense in some abstract way, but make an actual practical difference in people's lives and the lives of their families and communities. Um, and, you know, I sometimes think in ter about the, the size of government question on the right being the equivalent of the inequality question on the left in that as conservatives and libertarians, we are often motivated by wanting less government, just as people on the left are motivated by wanting more sort of absolute equality uh, of income and, and wealth. But most people don't actually think in such terms and they will, they sort of, they like the idea of more equality. They like the idea of less government, but they need some intermediate step. They need something translated for them where they see this particular thing, which you know the left may be interested in because of equality, will actually do something for them. Will make their health premiums lower. You know that's the sales pitch anyway, um, or or will will help their kids' education. And I do think that the, the right sometimes has forgotten to make that kind of sale. And people are totally willing to be in favor of something that shrinks the government, that liberates markets, that gives families more say, but they want to know how it's gonna work in practice for their benefit, how it's gonna mean, mean safer streets and higher take-home pay and so forth. And we sometimes forget to finish the sentence. Uh, Donna, look, I think one of the things we on the right need to recognize is what the new social construct is, which from my perspective is it's no longer about race, it's no longer about gender. So it, 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 because if it were about, for instance, if it were about race and gender, black conservative women would be on a platform, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think from my perspective, what I see is the social construct is 
oppressed versus the oppressor. So that's why a black conservative woman, what, what Trump said is the fact that she's a conservative. Oh my gosh, she must be part of the, oh, the class that is oppressing us. I think we need to um, show people in this new social construct, which by the way, we're not gonna get rid of, I don't think anytime soon. So we have to work within, within it and, 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 and change the message that more freedom is 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 the best thing for those who feel victimized because you you you, you raise yourself up and you put your you can elevate your status um, and that and that the biggest oppressor traditionally is government historically the that um, oppression a lot of times gets codified into some kind of law and, um, and, and freedom is taken away from somebody. So I think we need to recognize that and be able to message it. Mm. Would you mind if I jumped back in on, on that thing? Because yeah, I do think this is a very important point. The Democrats and the progressives tend to tell a story in which most people are sort of passive victims waiting to be rescued mostly by the federal government, but also by state governments. And that is a story that I think most people don't recognize themselves in. And there is an opportunity for conservatives and Republicans to tell a different story. Now, the story that conservatives and Republicans sometimes tell is all of us want to be entrepreneurs. We're just all dying to start our own businesses. And that's an important part of America. And a lot of people have done a lot of good and that's an important part of conservatism. But I think there's another story to which more people can relate than either of those ones. And that's just the normal person who is trying to go about his or her life has their own ideas, their own objectives uh, and government is frequently an obstacle to them, or it's irrelevant to them, and it's a source of frustration. They don't think of themselves as oppressed, uh, and they don't think of themselves as great innovators. But they think of some, but themselves as people who they would they would like the government to be kind of working with them or alongside them. They don't want to be working for it. And Ramesh brings up this is a great point. Did you you know where we saw this in 2020, Donna? In, in and everybody, school choice, right? Because government run schools were shut down. And, and, and if you, we, Carolina Journal just did an entire, we dedicated an entire um, um, addition to sp kids with special needs or have, have challenges beyond just, you know, going to your traditional K-12 school and their promised services, right? The government's supposed mm -hmm. to give them services. And you find out what happens when government isn't doing what it said it would do. You, you, you've said, okay, I put my faith in them and they didn't do it. And these parents struggling, desperate because they've got a special needs child, an autistic child who doesn't just need cognitive um, you know, help or um, additional ser services cognitively, maybe they need occupational therapy. And now they're regressing. Um, Things like school choice and, and parents having the freedom to choose, those are issues that, that for instance, in North Carolina, 81% of North Carolina likely voters support educational choice. Parents' ability to have the freedom to choose what is best for them. We need to be better at work at, 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 at telling that story. Um, I mean, I love to talk tax rates and electricity policy as much as the next person. But where the rubber meets the road is to, is to Ramesh's point, which is that the average person, just the person. And to me, COVID provide, as horrible as it was, also just was shining a light on places where people sort of had, had kind of some faith in government and now realize, oh my gosh, they kept my child from learning, from having services. That was a great point that you brought up, Ramesh. Thank you. You know, what you're describing in some ways sounds to me the way that the left tends to frame their views. It's framed in terms of fairness 
and social justice. So help our, the folks who are watching us now understand what is the conservative argument? How do conservatives and free marketers say, look, we really are the ones who care about fairness for you, and we do care about justice, but we think about it in a bit different mm -hmm. way. How do we describe that? And Ramesh, I, I know that you write so frequently about these types of issues and, and what to do going forward. Do you have any thoughts to share on that? You know, I do think that um, to, to, to come back to education, I think that this, this past year as a teaching opportunity about school choice and the need for options and the fact that one size doesn't fit all, that's kind of a, a window into the kind of argument that we need to be putting forward, I think, as, as people on the right. And it's, um, it's, it's an argument that doesn't talk, doesn't, that isn't just sort of, um, abstract uh, about fairness, um, but actually sort of demonstrates we're on your side. Because I think that the problem that historically has faced conservatives and libertarians is this idea that we are uncaring and, and particularly that we are mostly concerned about the interests of rich people and the interests of big business. And you need to have these issues where you illustrate um, no, actually, we're for the person who wants to start a business, hair braiding, and isn't allowed to do so by the government because the government's actually siding with the powers that be and the entrenched players in this industry. We're the people who want to be with, as, uh, as Amy was saying, with the, the family of this autistic child who needs things that are not being provided by this monopoly government provider. Uh, and we're going to give them the tools. You know, and that's another thing to get back to what I was saying earlier. We're not exactly solving your problem for you. We are giving you the tools whereby you can solve them for, you, the, for yourself, according to your own best judgment for yourself and for your family. I think that's the kind of thing we have to do is to sort of find these issues where you can apply our bedrock conservative and libertarian philosophy, but in ways that help uh, change the, the, the frame in which we're often put and in which sometimes we collude in putting ourselves. Boy, I can relate to that because sometimes I know I have to remind myself, stop talking in terms of telling people they've got to eat their vegetables because it's really going to be good for them down the road. <laughs> you know, we talk a, a lot about uh, the long term and, um, you know, what will happen five years from now, 10 years from now, if you do A, B, and C or don't do A, B, and C, where I find that most people are concentrated on the short term, what's happening with them. Uh, right now. Uh, interesting, Ramesh, you, you brought up the, the issue of entrepreneurship and business and, and all that. Boy, I'll tell you what, it, it seems almost like a realignment, the time we're living in right now, specifically in terms of business and corporations, which you normally mm. would think of as being much more on the right. But today, they seem to be like the tip of the spear for progressive causes, Major League Baseball, which Amy and I are both huge baseball fans, uh, even though she she suffers from being a Rockies fan. I'm a Dodgers yeah. fan. But uh, <laughs> but Major League Baseball, my goodness, now they have, have stepped to the forefront of all of this. So is it a realignment? Well, I think in part, uh, conservatives have been a little bit... Um, Maybe, maybe naive, uh, maybe we should find a softer word for it, uh, about business, um, because businesses are not necessarily natural supporters of markets and conservatism. And a lot of businesses are, in fact, in so far as they're interacting with government, primarily interested in getting advantages, um, getting special favors and privileges from the government and on social issues, um, you know, businesses have never been particularly helpful in general um, with conservatives. Uh, and they've often been on the other side. I think what one of the things that's happening now is we've got this larger political realignment in our country where particularly um, people with uh, college educations, college degrees um, who are clustered around large cities are moving left and the non-degreed population, increasingly interestingly, not just the white 
uh, population there um, is has been moving right. Well, and one of the things that means is that large businesses, um, particularly as they're trying to recruit young people who have recently graduated college and are in these big cities, they are catering to this employee base as much as they are catering to their customers. And they believe that they've got to move left as a result. I do think that we are in a very difficult situation um, where people are only slowly waking up to this, um, uh, to, to, the, to the idea that some people are going to be sort of dictated to um, by these businesses um, unless they sort of stand up. And I think, you know, conservatives in particular have not been great boycotters. Um, that's been a tactic that has been much more associated um, with the left. And that's something that maybe is going to have to change if we are going to change the incentives of these business decision makers um, so that they're not constantly a force that is, um, that is pushing toward the left and away from the right. Amy, it, it seems to me that entertainment um, and sports used to be the area where you could go for respite from policy and politics. Uh, then entertainment uh, became uh, much more uh, publicly and vocally uh, progressive. And now sports seems to have joined the fray. Does that, for you as a, a lover of freedom and liberty, make you change your own personal decisions? I mean, are you going to uh, not go to baseball games now, or do we just have to step aside and say, let them do whatever they want? Um, I'm just going to try to enjoy this as a, as a, uh, a break from all of this. So, uh, and to Donna's point, I am a long-suffering Rockies <laughs> fan. Um, went to game four of the one World Series they went to where Boston swept them in four. So, uh, but, but if you see the Missouri flag behind me, I actually, uh, my formative years were in St. Louis. So um, I, I actually am now going to be a, I'm a Nolan Arenado fan and he's now playing third base for the Cardinals. So I'm back to my original love. Yeah. You know, everything every comes full circle. <laughs> we're, yeah, it's fickle. It's fickle. But you want to know, to your point, Donna, so you asked the question about do we do um, – yesterday, I, you know, Sunday, uh, I, Sunday afternoon, I would have probably had a baseball game on. I would have been tuned into my MLB app um, and had something – and had one of the baseball games on. And instead – I don't have it anymore. I worked out in my garage, refinishing a piece of furniture, actually listened to a little Victor Davis Hanson, a couple of his podcasts, our, our National Review folks will be happy to know that, Jack Fowler and, and uh, Victor Davis Hanson do a great job. Um, so I don't, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, I have no idea what the standings are. I mean, none. And, and that's my own personal choice. Major League Baseball and get a you know they're not going to lose any money over me, um, but but to your occasionally I just don't want you know you know you, you want to tune into a baseball game mm -hmm. and just watch baseball. I just want to see a great game. When I was doing talk radio, so for those who don't know, I, I for ten years I did a, a a my own talk show two hours a day, and every Friday was a movie and wine review, and about. I guess it was about 2012, 2013, and I did this up till 2015. So about the last two to three years of doing that, uh, I stopped doing, uh, or I, I scaled back the amount of movie reviews I did because I got sick of being lectured to. And if I were gonna, if I'm talking to listeners and mm -hmm. saying, oh yeah, by the way, go ahead and spend 10 bucks on a ticket and they're gonna lecture you about how horrible you are or how whatever. Um, I started doing book reviews instead and found I could get authors on and we could, it, hmm. it became more interesting. Um, I, uh, I, I don't wanna be lectured to. I, I, you know, I, I just wanna sometimes watch a baseball game or watch a football game. And in fact, I even tweeted out, Somebody give me a sport where I can just watch it. I don't even care if it's curling. Just tell, because I'm competitive. I will watch anybody compete on anything, but I just don't want to be lectured to on it. And, 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 I, and I have a feeling I'm not by myself. Yeah, and I, and I think that it's, it's a real shame that the number of those sort of refuges 
from politics has dwindled, um, that, uh, that everything is being politicized and turned into an issue um, in, in a way that, uh, that is, I think, unhealthy for our country. Uh, for a lot of reasons, one of them just being that it's it gives it gives people who are on different sides of politics um, less that they can bond over. You know, Ramesh, right. um, it, you you wrote an interesting tribalism. Th- tribalism. Yeah, Ramesh, you wrote an interesting piece for National Review in which you kind of looked ahead at the Biden administration and. Um, threw out some very interesting kind of pros and cons about the best way for free marketers and conservatives to approach the Biden administration. On the one hand, you're saying, you know, fight back with with policy ideas. But on the other hand, there are some political realities that could actually work to conservatives' favor, just simply historically, meaning that after an election of a president, typically at the midterm, the other party will pick up seats. Talk to us a little bit, if you would, about that tension where policy and politics uh, mm. really just uh, in, come together in a way that you cannot avoid. I think a lot of Republican politicians um, around the country, really, but but also particularly in Washington, D.C., look back at the experience of being in opposition during the last two Democratic presidencies, the Clinton presidency and the Obama presidency, and just sort of assume that the strategy they can follow now is to sort of sit back and let victory rain down upon them, because the first midterm under Clinton and the first midterm under Obama were blowouts for the Republican Party. Now, that's typically because um, in a midterm election, the party that has control of the White House, its voters are maybe a little bit complacent or to some degree maybe a little disappointed because they haven't gotten everything that they wanted. And the opposition party's voters are really riled up and, and, and ready to go, ready to fight. Um, and that could happen this time, but, uh, but I think it would be a mistake to just sort of assume that's gonna happen. Um, and even to assume that all you have to do is oppose Um, misguided progressive initiative, as important and crucial as I think that that is, I do think it's also important to do the work of suggesting what our own agenda as conservatives and libertarians is, what we want to see happen if voters entrust our allies with power. I think that's important for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, if at some point you actually win, right, if you're in 2025 and you've got control of the government, you know, you have more of a sense of what you're going to do. You've got more buy-in around across your coalition with what you're going to do. I think our failure to do that in healthcare really hurt us in repealing Obamacare in 2017. It's a big part of the reason we did not succeed in a full repeal and replacement of Obamacare. And I think the other thing is just that I think that there are voters who who respond to it, right? It's not enough, I think, for us to say these are bad ideas. Um, I think you have to clinch that case by saying there's also a better way to run things, you know. Um, and sometimes that's, you know, there's a better way to um, address healthcare. There's a better way to expand educational opportunity. And sometimes it's also just you know, we should be talking about something completely different. There are some, there are issues here that are not being addressed um, that are more important than uh, than some of the issues that are on the Democratic agenda. So, for example, you know, right now, we, this last week, we've got this commission to um, quote unquote reform the courts. Um, you know, there are other issues that uh, that matter. We're not talking about it as much as we were talking about it in 2017, but there's still an opioid epidemic, for example, that has a really fearsome, uh, really grim death toll. And maybe we need to be talking about that and, and ways of addressing that instead of what happens to be the agenda of, of uh, the political class. Uh, Donna, can I jump in on that? Because that... It- little cautionary tale, but also to, to um, build on what Ramesh said. And so 2018, left takes, gets all, you know, control of all levers of power of government at the state level. And so if we, if we you know, the, what, the way it plays out, okay, well, then in the state legislature, conservatives will pick up seats. 
wrong. Didn't happen. Mm -hmm. They actually lost seats in the Senate. They picked up one or two, maybe one in the House, but it was a net, it was, a, if I remember cor correctly, a net loss in 2020. Um, so, so you can't rely on that, that that's going to happen and just, you know, to your point, victory rained down upon you. But from my own perspective, I, I, I am the worst kind of free marketeer. I am the converted kind, um, which means, you know, I wear it on my sleeve. I wear it proudly. I, I, I will evangelize about it. But it came to be in 1994 with the contract with America. So to the point of, here's what we're gonna do, um, that, that, that contract with America, and I, you know, that's when I had to tell my parents, oh yeah, by the way, you know, that they, they were Roosevelt Democrats and they were wondering why I wasn't upset about the 94 elections. And I'm like, well, I voted, I voted <laughs> differently this time. And um, that was a struggle for them. We all ended up getting past it, but to the point of here's what we're gonna do. It's really simple. Here's what it looks like, but also know that we have to do it within this sort of social construct of they're gonna say, oh my gosh, uh, more free equals more oppression. It's very Orwellian to National Review's, you know, your next book club event. It's very Orwellian, you know, freedom is tyranny. And um, we have to be able to message that to everybody. And, and all of these different groups, uh, you, you know, we saw it happen here in North Carolina where these grassroots groups that have popped up because they're very concerned about what has happened. Um, work, you know, everybody going in the same direction, whether, you know, it's on K-12 education or somebody worried about mandates or, or somebody else worrying about masks, whatever it is, that we're all on the side of freedom and here's how we need to play a long game, but here's what we need to do to get there and, and kind of have, have that strategy laid out. You know, Ramesh, to Amy's point here, you know, for those of us who believe that states are really where it's at and states are so important to be able to uh, kind of fashion their own environments politically and policy-wise based on the makeup of, of, um, of their populace and their particular challenges, et cetera, it's incredibly alarming that there is so much muscular activity at the federal level. You know, Amy mentioned that her parents were Roosevelt Democrats. Well, if you believe what you read by a number of columnists these days, Joe Biden wants to be the next Roosevelt. And you gotta give the guy credit for, you know, just marching ahead. I mean, he is moving fast on a lot of major transformational things. And we're looking now at HR1, the potential federalizing of elections. We're looking at an infrastructure plan that has very little infrastructure in it, even though there are pieces of that that there could probably be bipartisan agreement on. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of things that, that make the federal government as mommy and daddy and the states and states kind of the ugly stepkids uh, being shunned to the corner. That's very concerning. It's a centralizing ideology, uh, modern progressivism is. And I think in this case, it actually creates some opportunities on the right side of the political spectrum, because I think we've got this odd combination right now where you've got enormously transformative ambitions on the part of the Democrats of Washington, D.C., but actually extremely limited ability to see that actually come to fruition. Uh, and I, so I think that they're, the, this is, uh, you know, their eyes are bigger than their stomach, maybe a little bit, um, because they can certainly, they have shown that they can spend a lot of money, but so many of the things on their wish list, I don't think that they have the, they have the ability to get through Congress. Uh, I mean, you're going to get to, I think, to the end of this Congress, a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, a Democratic White House, they're not going to have a $15 minimum wage. They're not going to have the District of Columbia as a state. They're not going to have a ban on assault weapons. They're not going to have HR1 and its ban on voter ID requirements in all the states. So at some point, I do think that there's a potential that progressives wake up and say, wait a second, we've got everything. Why, why have we got so little in return for it? And meanwhile, I think uh, you get a chance as conservatives 
and libertarians to say, these are all the things that they want to do. These are all the things that they're trying to do. And we now have this chance to see how hard they're fighting for these left-wing initiatives that were not front and center during the 2020 campaign. And let's actually put a nail in the coffin of their being able to do it in this next election. Amy, do you think that Biden is going to be able to get a lot of these major transformational things that, that he is proposing, um, considering where he is um, with his votes in the, in the House and the Senate? Or is Ramesh right? It's, it's uh, kind of all eyes, but it won't actually be there and be done at the end. Um, well, I, I'm the worst political prognosticator, so I will just say that right now. Um, I think we make a mistake. One, if we think Joe Manchin's going to be reasonable. I just don't think he is. I, they may delay something so they don't have to put him into a, a, a position where he has to vote. I just, I don't believe at the end of the day that Joe Manchin is going to be the, and Kristen Cinema uh, from Arizona, I don't believe those two senators are going to stand in the way of their of their machine, of their party. Um, if if it comes to, if it comes down to those two, I think we're in a world of hurt. When I say we, I mean those of us who are right of center and actually care about freedom. Um, so it, I also don't think that the left cares at all about. I mean, they don't care about being called hypocrites. They like all of that stuff is so yesterday, and. Um, to me, they look, they probably see they have a two year window. Mm. They're going to try and shove as much stuff through as they possibly can, see what they can get. Um, frankly, having seen Joe Biden, I'm not certain it's Biden's, I don't think it's Biden's agenda at all. I think he's just, you know, old Joe from Scranton is just not like, I mean, this is a guy who, who, um, you know, stood stood side by side with Jesse Helms. I just don't think that's the guy we have up there. And I don't actually think he's necessarily in control of what that agenda is. So will they get it? You know, I, I guess I've, I, I, maybe I've got a little PTSD from being in Colorado and thinking, no, that's not gonna happen. And then sure enough, it does. Um, so I'm gonna hope that it doesn't and that, um, and that and that this right of center freedom movement uh, works together to stop this stuff, um, bad policy going forward, but all in the immediate time frame. But then um, plays a long game as well. Meaning we've got to, you know, blow up the monopoly of K twelve education, which we're already doing, and some other things that we must do in order to make, um, to give freedom a chance. You know, Ramesh, um, it, it's been obvious for the last several presidential cycles that North Carolina is a battleground state and the Democrats would, would love nothing more than be able to take um, the U.S. Senate seat now held by Richard Burr and he will be retiring from that seat. So 2022 is gonna be a big time U.S. Senate election here. And then right after that, of course, the next presidential election my question I'd love to, to know your thoughts on is this. In terms of free marketers and conservative leaders, who should we be hanging our hats on? Who should we be listening to? Who do you see who essentially gets it from a conservative libertarian point of view mm. and has the chops, the juice, whatever you want to call it, to actually make that compelling argument about people, not just policy, but people, and carry this forward? So I think it's important to avoid anointing people um, prematurely and to um, let them out there compete. Uh, and 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 because we don't all know, we don't know what's the exact way to have a message that um, that brings people together on the right and then allows us to expand our reach. Uh, I think we have to see them in action. Uh, and sort of trust the market and trust the people um, to make a to make a good decision. I think what you want to do is look at look to the people who are capable though of doing those two key things: uniting and then expanding, uh, and not just being 
you know, I, I think what we should avoid, what we should uh, shun is people who seem mostly interested in driving some people out than in bringing new people in. Amy, you have thoughts on voices that you're listening to? Yeah, actually, that's a, those are, those are great points. I, I think one of the things we, we, um, we have to realize is that I, I, I know in my lifetime, I never would have thought any Republican candidate would have gotten 75 million and then been beaten by somebody who got 80 million. I mean, it was staggering the amount of people that um, but I think we have to recognize the shift in, um, in the political landscape, which was alluded to earlier. Um, the, the percentage, and just you can sort of anecdotally even see it on, on social media, uh, black men who are starting to look at right of center as, as, a, as a place that they're, more, that they're comfortable being. And I think you have to look at people who um, who have won either you know tough elections or have, to the point do they have the chops? I mean, I I appreciate Ron DeSantis one for how he won, for how he's handled COVID, and for how he's handled the media. Um, he, he in this in this atmosphere right now that we're in, whoever it is has to be fearless because I don't know anybody else who's going to be able to get away with the Joe Biden style campaign. I just were, you know, he sits in the basement and every, all your surrogates do it for you. Um, I think it's going to be, have to be somebody to, I, I, I agree. You, you can't, we don't, uh, we don't want to anoint someone and we've got to break away from this cult of personality. Um, and to some extent, the left did it this time because Joe Biden, look at, was he their first choice? No, they essentially said, oh, wait, we got to put somebody in there who can win. We don't care who it's got to be Biden. Um, Obama was a cult of personality. Donald Trump is a cult of personality. Um, and, and then they put Biden in who Kamala Harris said was a racist. And now she's the vice president. So, so, um, I, I, I hate to, you know, I want to avoid that as, as much as Ramesh does, but if you're looking at somebody, I'm always looking to see what Ron DeSantis is saying. Yeah. You know, one, one last thing on that. I've been pretty critical of, uh, of Trump, um, but I'll tell you, in 2024 for the Republican nomination, I don't want a Trump Republican. I don't want an anti-Trump Republican. I want a 2024 Republican. Right, somebody who is actually focused on what American voters are concerned about, and is not just stuck on relitigating um, the disputes of the recent past. About a week or so ago, I was um, trying to get away from politics and and policy, and and uh, inadvertently stepped right back into it, but in a good way. I picked up a biography of Johnny Carson. And I happened to find in there, written by his former attorney and friend, that Carson apparently was anti-big government, um, anti-bullies, and he was a personal friend of Ronald Reagan. Reagan, obviously, you know, from the, the Hollywood days. So I went looking on YouTube, and sure enough, I found a clip, which I actually posted on our blog here at the John Locke Foundation, The Locker Room. You can get there at johnlocke.org, by the way, and you can find it. It's great. I would recommend you watch it. And Ronald Reagan, I have to say, you know, this was back in the, the 70s and right before the 76 election. And he and Johnny Carson for like 10 or 12 minutes just talking about things. Reagan was so comfortable. And on the one hand, Ramesh, I, I am so delighted that to continue to watch Ronald Reagan and appreciate him because he was the happy warrior. And he, you could tell he was talking from his heart and, and his gut, not just from his, his head. But at the same time, that was many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, do we need to look for someone who is not a, um, a copycat Ronald Reagan, but at least someone who has it in their gut that they, they feel comfortable talking about it and that they are a happy warrior for freedom? I, I think that we sometimes forget some of the lessons of Reagan because he was so successful. Um, it's not just, you know, he didn't run the Goldwater campaign, but with a smile and with more political talent, although that is true and that was part of it. 
he ran a campaign that addressed the challenges that Americans faced in the late 1970s, in the 1980s. He answered those challenges with a conservative philosophy. We don't have the same challenges. We don't have the same circumstances, partly because Reagan, again, was so successful. Um, what You can take the same philosophy, the same preference for markets over centralized government, for individual responsibility over collectivism, for traditional ethics over you know, the latest fads and apply them to the challenges we have today in a winning way. And that I think is in a way following the Reagan example because if Reagan were around today, he would not be running on the Republican platform of 1980. You know, he wouldn't be talking about the same things that he would that Reagan actually did in 1980. And so in a way you kind of have to follow his example by breaking from his example. Very, very interesting. Well, at, at my core, I am an optimist. And so I'd like to end our time today by asking each of you, what are you optimistic about? It's so easy to get bogged down into the many challenges and we know they're real, but are you optimistic about anything that you see or you hear, Ramesh? I'm going to I'm going to mention two things. Uh, one, I do think that that education is a, is uh, an opportunity because I think that that the that the number of people who've been awakened, uh, so to speak, to use the woke speak, um, to uh, to the problems of the current system has really increased. It doesn't need to be a majority to be a lot larger than what it used to be. And then second, young people. And this ties into what I was just saying because you know, experience is a teacher. And this is an example of that which happened on schools. But I think in general, as people experience the results of bad government and good government, they learn, they react. And we shouldn't just, we should never write off any group of people, any racial group, any uh, religious group, any age group, um, because we're constantly going to make inroads as people learn from experience. Amy, what are you optimistic about? Uh, well, I have two things too. So the first one is, um, is I agree, education. I think not only have we learned that this experiment or this the government controlled education, what happens, that it is not up to meeting the challenge at, at, during a time of crises, um, I, I think K-12 education will look very different next year, five years, 10 years from now, and um, a, a, as it should. So very optimistic about that. The other one is um, I'm actually optimistic about freedom. And here's why, because um, one, our form, whatever you thought of the of, of Donald Trump, and, and I, everybody knows I supported him, and and um, I actually worked for um, his transition team. But he did manage. He he expanded. He he expanded that base with with African American voters, and we can build upon that. And freedom always finds a way. It, it's a little bit like water through rocks, right? You know, you throw, put a bunch of rocks in a, in a creek and you're trying to block it up as a kid, you know, I'm gonna make a dam and you're gonna, well, it, it always finds a way. It may take time, you have to play a long game, but I think freedom always finds a way because I think it's innate in the human spirit. And those who try to force it down um, are actually the ones who are, who are going against human nature. So. You know, when I think about 2022 or 2024 or whatever, I, I want somebody who, who is pro-freedom and, and can be freedom's champion. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know who that is, but whoever it is, I hope that our Freedom Network can, can, can provide an infrastructure that supports freedom, regardless of who that, that person is that might be at the top. So I'm actually optimistic about that because I, I, I just don't think you can keep it down. You can't keep human spirit down. 
And it really is a freedom network, and I'm so glad that you, you mentioned that, Amy, because, for example, today we are here at the John Locke Foundation uh, collaborating with our friends at National Review Institute. And I'm wondering, Chris Sansomino, Chris, um, uh, would you like to join us uh, back here for a moment and talk a little bit about this freedom network and uh, why it is that you're reaching out to groups, um, state think tanks like the John Locke Foundation? Well, sure. Thank you so much again for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, we, you know, we're based in New York City, and uh, a lot of our writers are on the East Coast. And what we, but our readership is not only nationwide; it's all across North America and the world. And we just find so much um, collaborative spirit out there with partnership groups like yourselves. And it's great to uh, to reinforce each other's messages. We find some of our readers aren't familiar with your work, with your work. And conversely, some of your followers in North Carolina aren't familiar with what National Review Institute is doing. Many know the magazine, not so many know the Institute. And it provides a great bridge to bring uh, people like Ramesh and some of our other talented folks um, really out to where people are. And it's also a great opportunity to kind of look at both local issues, but from a national perspective. And we can't really do that without the help of everyone all across the country. So thank you all again on this panel for, for for the opportunity. And I know we're gonna be looking forward to doing it in person next time. Oh, that would be great. Chris Cian, Samino, and Ramesh Panuro, thank you so much. You know, Amy, um, we are looking forward to being able to hopefully get back to normal as soon as possible, maybe do some things, um, some, some events out in person, but continue with collaborations like this one with National Review Institute. Amy, I know that that's really a, a goal of yours, to reach out as much as possible and to solidify this freedom network, not only in North Carolina, but across the country. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I would agree. And of course, um, you know, agree certainly with what Chris said. Part, part of what we want to do is also be a, a leader um, with obviously within North Carolina, but to show what we can do at the state level as a role model for other states. So if we can collaborate, help build a freedom infrastructure that, um, that secures victories that are uh, free market, um, individual liberty, if we can do that in, in North Carolina and role model that for other organizations, that's our goal. Freedom is always our mission. Regardless of the person, freedom comes first. So that's what we try to do here at the Locke Foundation and try and role model that for other groups. Love being partners with National Review Institute. And so thanks to, to them for, for being a part of this today. Amy Cook, Ramesh Panuru, Chris uh, Ciansamino, thank you so much for joining us. And folks, we couldn't obviously do any of this without you. We are so delighted that you have taken the time to join us. That means you're leaders, you care, you're involved, and that's exactly what we need in this network for freedom. Lastly today, I would ask you to consider this. If you like what you are seeing, if you like what we're doing here at the John Locke Foundation, we do need your su support, your financial support. We are a nonprofit group, and we would ask you to consider making a tax-deductible financial contribution to help us continue moving freedom forward in North Carolina. It's quick, it's simple. Just go to johnlock.org. Up in the upper right-hand corner, hit the Donate tab. It's secure. It'll take you less than two minutes to make that donation. We would greatly appreciate your support. It's been a wonderful day. We love these collaborations. We know we're going to be doing more of them down the road. And we're so glad that you appreciate Shaftesbury Society every Monday. I want you to have a good week. Join us next Monday. On behalf of the entire John Locke Foundation and Carolina Journal team, I'm Donna Martinez. Have a good one, and thanks for being with us.